West Midlands MEP Nikki Sinclair is one of our most colourful and unorthodox politicians. Well, politically, she's fallen out with UKIP and formed her own party. And now she's written of the threats of exposure that led her to reveal she had an operation to change from a man to a woman. Well, I'll be talking to Nikki Sinclair in a moment, but first, our political editor, Patrick Burns, has this assessment of her career so far. This lib lab con do not believe in democracy. For a victory years. speech like no other. Nikki Sinclair telling the other parties exactly what she thought of them. You are nothing better than fascists and dictators. <laughs> but just six months later, she'd parted company with her own over UKIP's links with the European Freedom and Democracy grouping in the European Parliament, which she said included homophobes and racists. Back home, passionate opposition to High Speed 2 became one of her trademark local issues, now as an independent MEP. So too, the gypsy encampment on Greenbelt land. She stood in Meriden for the Solihull and Meriden Residents Association at the last general election, securing 1.3% of the vote. But also in 2010 came allegations about expenses and allowances, which led eventually to Nikki Sinclair and three others being arrested by West Midlands police on suspicion of conspiracy to defraud the European Parliament. Almost two years after her arrest, Nikki Sinclair remains on police bail. She strenuously denies any wrongdoing. Undaunted, she launched her campaign for an immediate referendum on Britain's future European Union membership, raising well over the 100,000 signatures required to force a Commons debate. The motion was defeated, but not before it had triggered the biggest rebellion against a Conservative Prime Minister on the European issue. No wonder Nikki Sinclair sees this as her defining theme. She plans to stand for her new We Demand a Referendum Now party in next May's European elections. Patrick Burns, BBC Middens Today. And Nikki Sinclair is here now. Good evening. Good evening. We're going to get on to the politics in just a moment, sure. but I'm interested to know why you've chosen to reveal now that you've had this operation to change from a man to a woman. And you've written very openly about it in your sure. book. Um, I think there are many reasons. There's not one defining reason. Uh, there, w there were threats um, to kind of d disclose my medical history, um, and I wanted to be the person to actually tell it and not get a call from a newspaper saying, we're going to run the story tomorrow, what's your quote? And so it took me a long time to put down in words, you know, um, what happened and how I felt about it from the age of three. I think a lot of people watching might find it quite difficult to understand mm. what you went through and, and what it was inside you that made you feel yeah. that you had to have this operation. Not a choice that you had to? Well, it's not a choice. It's not a choice. Um, most people, probably the vast majority, probably 98% of the people who are watching this programme has never, ever questioned their gender in their life. It becomes natural to them. But for, unfortunately, a very small minority of us, um, we, from a very early age, from three in my case... Three years old? Three, I knew something. I couldn't, obviously, understand exactly what it was, but from that age, I knew there was something so fundamentally wrong with me. Um, and... It took me many years to, to solve that problem. And you say solve that problem. Yeah. I mean, at what stage did you decide well, to I couldn't, do something about it? I couldn't do anything until I was 16. And then I went to see a doctor. And the doctor told me to go away and grow up. Go uh, away and grow up? Yeah. And she said, if you carry on like this, you end up living in London as a drug addict and a prostitute. Charming. And um, I sought help from some help groups who eventually, which were, was a very scary experience. And I you know, really go into detail about this in the book. And unfortunately, in those days, in the 1980s, we weren't so enlightened. And I phoned the hospital and they said they couldn't see me until I was 21, which seemed like a life sentence. Having made that decision, having gone through the operation, did you feel that you had come home in some way? Well, it just felt like myself. And probably what people won't understand is that all that time up to you know, me changing at 23, I was actually pretending to be someone mm. I wasn't. And now, when I get up in the morning, I'm myself. And the only things that I think about are, what am I doing today? What are my objectives today, representing my constituents in the European Parliament? Well, let's talk about that, Nikki. OK. What reaction have you had from people since, uh, since this, you came out with this revelation? Well, my mobile surgery's been out uh, a few times since um, this was uh, in the newspapers, and we've had actually no reaction. <laughs> we've no, not one single question. Um, Twitter and social media has been absolutely fa fantastic. I mean, literally hundreds of positive messages, and I think we only had about two or three, only even slightly negative. 
So I think that's quite positive and um, quite pleasing. I did actually a YouGov poll, which is in the book, which says that 66% of people would see it as no mm. difference. But interestingly, in the Midlands, that figure actually went up to 70%, so we must be the most tolerant place in the country. <laughs> well, which is some good news. But let's talk about your political ambitions. I mean, mm. realistically, without the backing of, of a major party, which clearly you don't have, yeah. you don't really stand much of a chance at the next European elections, do you? Well, I disagree. I, th I think I've been the most active MEP um, of the seven in the West Midlands. I'm the only MEP in the whole country that has a mobile surgery. And most of your viewers wouldn't have seen me because I represent 5.1 million people. But I've met many thousands of people on this mobile surgery and the only MEP to do this. Um, in the European Parliament, I'm listed as the most uh, active of all seven MEPs. So I've been really representing them and I, and I think that will show because I've been there on the streets. And you know, the, what you said in your VT, you know, I was the one, not UKIP, that forced that debate in Parliament. What were you keep doing when I did that? Um, and also, you know, with food banks, with, with HS2, with debt relief, with rural affairs, I've been at the forefront. International human rights, I've, I'm very active, which doesn't really get any media, but, you know, I've visited prisons of conscience in Bahrain, for example. Nikki, um, so much more we could have spoken Absolutely. about, but thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you.